Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Show with your host, Jeff Lopes. We are live. We are live on the Jeff Knows Inc. Podcast. I am your host. Across the screen from me, I got probably the greatest bearded man on our podcast ever, Michael Faber. What is up, brother? What's up, bro? Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here, man. Thanks for letting me on, even with the beard. Uh, it's okay. No, that, that, that was probably the reason that I got you on. When, I, when we first met, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it was Clubhouse or social media, somewhere we interacted, we had gone on a call, we had a great conversation, and I could see a lot of things happening in the future between us collaboration-wise. Great dude. Tons of things happening. Tons and tons of things happening. When I was talking to him the first time we talked, I was like, okay, like I thought my life was busy. Michael is just as busy, if not more busy. He's got a ton of things going on, and we're going to go through a lot of that, go through his life, go through his journey. He had a, a great story, but it's also a great ending, and it's such an incredible things that are happening with his life as a father, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as a coach. There's so many layers there. So, Michael, how we always start up a podcast is I just allow the guests, or I would say guests, I would allow our audience to learn about the guests, what you're currently up to, and then we'll let the story flow from there. So what are you up to now? And where are you in your life right now? Oh, man. Hey, that's a great question. All right. Uh, you told me I was going to say that, and I already said it. Uh, literally, first, I think you just planted the seed. So it was like you, you planted the bomb and just exploded into a wood. Oh, well, well done. Well done. I'm going to remember this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, where am I right now? My, fo- my main focus is Unleash You Now, the movement of it. Some people say it's a business, but I really look at it as a movement. Right, and that's really to unleash each and every single person to the greatness in which they're here for. Right, we're all here to create a masterpiece. I don't care what you call it, you can call it God, the universe, cosmic winds, tree, dirt like, I don't care. Right, call it whatever you will. That's not my debate, but whatever it is, doesn't sit up there and be like, Hey, you're gonna have a good life. Hey, you're not. Hey, you're right. Like, that's not how it goes. It's not like some lucky lotto where we don't even get a ticket and see who wins. It's we're all here and we all can do something amazing. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean I can paint like Michelangelo, right? Like that doesn't mean I can paint the system. You give me a paintbrush and some paper and you're going to make fun of me, right? And that's okay. I'm probably going to make fun of me too, right? It's because I can't paint worth damn, right? So I'm trying to G-rate myself just so you know, I'm trying hard. So (laughs) it's, but your masterpiece doesn't have to be that. Your masterpiece is in what you create, right? There are some people that create art by telling stories. Yeah, 100%. Right? There's some, right? There's some people that create art by creating fabric. Yeah. Right? Like your art doesn't have to be a painting. There's some people that paint art with song, right? Or uh, music, beat, right? Like the the guy, I always say, like, I I give thanks to the guy that paints a masterpiece outside every day, the street sweeper, right? The guy that takes the street cleaner down because that makes it okay for my kid to go outside and me to go outside where we're not worried about debris or anything that could harm us, right? Like that's painting a masterpiece for people to enjoy something, to expand, to live your life at a greater level, right? And when we look at it that way, we're all here for it. And I just want you to do that and take off all the things we normally let hold us back, right? Family expectations, traditions, society norms, cultural, right? Where we're not supposed to live a certain life or not do a certain thing, right? The system of schooling teaches us how to be employees. It doesn't teach us how to be entrepreneurs, right? It's taking those chains off that we, that we build as we grow, right? And it's funny. One of the things I, I used to think was one of the biggest hinders of me was my life growing up because Uh, I took different routes, right? Like I took different streams to get down the river. And I used to think that was a hinder to me. But now when I actually was having this conversation this morning, it's that now I look back and I'm like, like, thank God, because that let me get the mindset that, and the framework and the vision to where that working 40, because this, this is just me personally, working 40 years for a gold watch and a mortgage on a white picket fence sounds like misery. Yeah. Right. Giving you 40 years for 10 years of freedom where I'm still paying off a fence. And to think that was like the dream at one point when I was young, they were like, you'd be lucky to achieve this. And I think taking off that and just living the life you want, if you want to work 40 years for someone and get that watch and the fence, cool. Like that's your thing. Go do it. But whatever, let's be open and go all out for our thing. Let me dive in there quick. Sorry. I want to dive a little deeper into that conversation. As parents, we're both parents, do you think it's our obligation as parents to try to bring out that thing in our children? Yes. And why I'm saying that because it's, it's, it's a lot of parents will either try to live 
vicariously through their children's lives, whether it was a sport or anything like that, or they're too busy with their own lives to give a shit what's happening in their lives. And as long as those kids have a roof over their head and food in their stomach, they think everything's okay. And as a parent, if we could put our children in as many opportunities and in front of as many faces as possible, we're giving them the opportunity to lock into something they fall in love with or have a passion for. And then it's our job to give them every resource to pursue that. Does that make sense what I'm saying? A hundred percent. Okay. So uh, what, what would you, what did you, what would you advise parents or how would you advise parents to look for that? You said it perfect. Listen, put, let them try it. Don't. So when my daughter, right, my, my, I have a 17 year old daughter, my daughter, I, I did exactly what you talked about earlier. I was like, I love sports, right? She's going to play sports. Right. And I put her into all the sports. She hit every single one. Right. I was just like, this is my, my father died when I was younger. I was like, this is my father getting back at me first. I have a daughter. Then she doesn't even like sports. Right. Like, I was like, this is like the exact opposite of me. Right. And um, so I'm like, oh my God. Right. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And it's like, yo, you're, you're going to live. Right. Like, then she got into horseback riding. I don't even like horses. She got into horseback riding, loved it. I bought a horse farm. She hated horses after it. Right. Now I got a horse farm. I don't even like horses. Right. I got like 13 of them. Right can't stand. I was like, listen, every day I'm like, I'm sending them to the glue factory. Like every day it's horrible. Right. But it's like every day, that's my mindset. Like, I'm like, this is miserable. I didn't even want them. I got them first. They didn't even like them. Right. Like, uh, and so it's, it's, but it was, it was her thing for a little while. Then wasn't her thing. She had a bad, uh, she had a bad showing at a competition and it was done. Right. She literally almost took out a judge's stable though. It was hilarious. I know nothing about horseback riding, but I knew something bad was happening because I was just like, the judges ran away from the table. I was just like, that's not normal. <laughs> there was one dude there, you could tell, doesn't run typically, right? And he was running, right? So uh, it was like, that wasn't her thing. And then like, I, we tried summer camps and not like summer camps physical, but we tried acting, right? We tried theater, right? And she got into back in theater, right? Something I wasn't really into. Uh, then she kind of was like, ah, eh, this isn't it. Then she found out that she loves writing. She's written like three novels now. It's something crazy. She's on some website where you can just continuously write a book. And she's on like on fa- chapter 58 or something of her, of her one book, right? It's insane, but she loves it. Now you're talking to the guy that still, I wrote two books. I didn't even write a word. I, you, I did transcribe because yeah. I can't write word. It, right? Like you want to make fun of me. Ah, I ruined it. I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Um, <laughs> I like you want to you want to make fun of me you, you can swear we're all good here no you want to make fun of me tell me to write some things I can't spell like I'm like oh my god like there's things well, I, I go to the whiteboard a lot and I'm like I don't know why I do the whiteboard because I can't spell anything so I'm like and I'm like trying to sound it out in my head writing it people are asking me if I'm okay in the audience right? I'm like <laughs> I'm fine I'm fine right like it's still a touchy subject no but <laughs> But she loves it. Like uh, literally, before I sent my book to the publisher to be edited, I sent it to her to edit my book. I love that. She came back to me. She goes, "Dad, we need to get better." I was like, <laughs> "Now I'm being parented by my kid, right?" So, so, but it's that's her thing. She loves it. But if we didn't go through all those no's, right? And if I tried to make her like, "No, you will. You'll you'll get it," uh, she wouldn't have found it. And then there would be that animosity in our relationship at some point that I never wanted because I had that with my dad and I never wanted that between me and her so it was always like yo I'll push but I'm not gonna force like I'm not gonna let you quit right like I'm not gonna let you just sit right like you're gonna try stuff so I'll push a little bit yeah. but then when that resistance is there I'm not gonna force you yeah. we're gonna talk about it we're gonna have the conversation I always told my daughter do- my daughter two things I wanted to build critical thinking yeah. I didn't want her to be like, what's the answer? I want to be like, think about, let's think about the different ways, see what's best for you. You believe and find the answer. So I think that's important in life. Right. right. And then, uh, and then two, so I never wanted to be here, do this. This is what you're doing. Right. Uh, she'll tell you, I've only done that twice in my life. And both times I still stand by what I did. So uh, that's how, that's how to the degree it was. Right. It was yeah. two times creepy people were involved. So I was yeah. just like, no, no. Right. Um, so it was, it, it's that always be able to decide for yourself. Right. And let's have the dialogue. Cause I always want you to be able to have a conversation with me. I never want you afraid to talk to me. I love that. I love right? that. One thing I've done, Michael is, and I think we talked about this prior is I'm very, I'm having a meal 
with a family to me is, is very special. And for almost, uh, I mean, I, I could probably count on my hands how many times I've probably missed in the last 11 years sitting down with my kids from having dinner. I'm trying to be home for dinner every night. And why I did that was I realized very quickly when our kids were very young, that was a great time when you're relaxed to have an open dialogue. And I thought if I could build this dialogue with them being comfortable doing something with me, when they get older, it'll continue. And I, we, and my daughter's 14 and we'll sit down and a meal and all of a sudden she'll blab and tell me everything about her friends and tell me her, because you have that open dialogue and we've, we've nurtured it and built it from day one. It hasn't right. been something at 14. Okay, let's sit down. Let's talk now. And she's like, whoa, <laughs> you haven't talked to me for 14 years. Like get away from me now. So we built that and we nurtured it from day one. So I think that's very important for parents to do that from the beginning. Don't think that you could jump into a teenage years and, and all of a sudden be number one parent. Cause they, that shit ain't happening. No, no. It's like anything else. It's like, think about like the businesses you've created and built, right? Yeah. And the, the things that you built from like zero to whatever. It's, it's consistent effort. Always. Yeah. And that, right. And that's the same thing as parenting. It's yeah. consistent effort. I'm consistently making, I do this. I love that you do that because I do the same thing. Like literally people are like, do you stay at the office all day? I'm like, no, I actually take my daughter to school first. Yeah. I'm in the office. I take my, I go and pick my daughter up from school, drive her home hang out with her a little bit. I make her chocolate milk. She still wants me to make it. It's really weird. I don't care. All right. It's, I'm, I'm still useful. It's cool. I make some chocolate milk. I'm like, here you go. We talk, whatever. I'm yeah. like, all right. I run back to the office for like two hours. I run back. I eat. I hang out. Right. Talk about any schoolwork if we need help or anything. If she wants to watch a movie or whatever, what she's going to do. She Then when she migrates to her bedroom, then I go back to the office if I need be. But it's like, I'll take those segments out of my day because yeah. building that relationship and having it consistently is what makes us be able to have the relationship. 100%. You, but you've also mastered your schedule and built these as blocks into your schedule, which a lot of people need to learn from because a lot of people don't do that. But a lot of people have a schedule, they have a routine, but they don't force blocks in and understand the importance of maintaining those blocks in their schedule because mm -hmm. they allow things to happen. They're at the office and they're like, oh, you know what? I, I got to finish this meeting, right? No, like when I'm, when it's 2.45, three o'clock, like today I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, I'm doing a, a live speaking thing. So that I'm going to be a little later, but, but at three o'clock, yeah, I'll talk about that after, but at three o'clock it's at 2.45, it's the computer's down. We're done. We're done. I'm on my way home. Mm -hmm. I'm on my way home. On the way home, I'll put on some music, hammer out some music, build my vibration, get, get in a good mood. So when you get home, your energy's high, you feel good. And then boom, have a great night with the kids. When the kids are done, they're for their dinner, they're done their workouts, they're going to go do their own stuff, chill, play their on their computers, or go and watch some TV. And then I'll go back to my home office and I'll answer something for an hour, two hours and do my stuff, right? So you build a routine, right? As long as you have a routine, understand your routine and, and, and focus and block it and schedule it properly, you could achieve anything you possibly want. Dude, I love something you said that I think so many more people need to hear, learn, and do is that you said you put on some music to change your vibration, right? Change your energy. Yeah. So you don't bring whatever happened that day energy into other people's lives, especially people that you don't want that kind of relationship with. And that was one of the biggest things for me to get, right? Like I had to understand, like, you know, they always say, well, whatever your cup's filled up is going to run out. Yeah. Right. Whatever that's filled up, right? They say like, it's the, uh, I forget who said it. it's like the lime you squeeze it, you know, lime juice is coming out, right? You know what it is. Yeah, yeah, whatever's yeah. in you comes out. Yes. Right. So it's like, whatever's in your cups going to pour into other people's cups. And I used to get so wound up with everything in my day and life. And then, and then I would go around my people and I'd be like, ah, and everybody's like, Jesus. Right. And then, and then they're doing it. And finally, when I started understanding, learning more about human behavior and neuroscience, that's, it's like, I'm setting the tone. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. Like I'm a tone setter. So it's like, how am I going to set this tone? And even when I, like, there was a, there was a brief period in my life where I got scarred as an entrepreneur deeper than I ever got scarred as an entrepreneur. Right. And it was like, I was like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this. Right. Like I never want this responsibility again. And I went and worked because uh, um, my studies are in human behavior and neuroscience and mental health. Right. So I want to work in mental health. And I worked at one point, I worked actually through the prisons in the state. Right. And uh, before I would go, it was so miserable. Before I would go in, I would have to listen to Three Little Birds by Bob Marley and Don't Worry, Be Happy because it got me into it where I wasn't walking in like, this is miserable. I was walking in like, I'm hype, right? And so then I started doing that at home too because I'm like, I don't want this to run off into this, right? So it's like, all right. So I was doing, and then there's sometimes- You can't see this, could you? Oh, there we go. Nice, Bob Marley. That's my dude. Bob Marley's my, my Don't man. Don't worry about a thing because everything's going to be all right. I got his own guest to quote. Yes, I love that. 
I love Look at that, that small world. Yeah. But it's there's sometimes I walk up to the door before I walk in the house and I'm just like, Rah! right, just get it out. Yeah. And then I walk in and I'm like, what's up? Right, like, you know, like guess who's here? Right, like you, like you don't know. It's, it's that right. reshift. It's that reshift, right? I, mm -hmm. I actually teach that to people where if you're coming home and you're in a bad mood, even if you're not in a bad mood, you might not realize you have built up. So I always tell people when you sit in front of your driveway, you pull into your driveway, slap your rear view mirror down, look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself one or two times you love your family. Dang right. Have a great night. Reset your mind. Take a deep breath. Don't just park, go, even if you're in a good mood, park, go and things, but you, you have buildup. Right. So, and sometimes I'll sit there and I'll actually just spend two, three minutes and just reflect on all the shit that happened today and just let it in and let it out of my head. Dang right. Take two seconds, just let it in, let it out. You're not, it's not meditating. It's just, 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 just let it in, let it out. Dang and right. once it's out of you, now you can reset and start again. And it's that reset and the reframing because we always hear that is, is, and there's a couple of things you brought in there and it's how, even with your daughters, is how you ask questions, how you interpret questions. And, that, and that's the human nature, right? So somebody turns to you and says, I, I got to go pick up my kids. No, I get to pick up my kids. Or I got to go be home for dinner. No, I get to be home for dinner. Like just changing the way we talk to ourselves makes a huge difference. And I think this is something obviously in your wheelhouse, right? How do, what's the easiest way to explain this? But how would you explain to another parent going home what advice would you do for them to like you said whether scream or to reframe and reship their heads to, when they walk in their house they feel clear again right so there's there's a couple ways one i always look at i always bring it to i'm a simple person man so i bring it to simple things yeah like most people like you know you've seen or you've done the idea where you put dominoes and you knock one and one hits the other and it just goes over and the train starts and all too often our days are like that yeah where it's like one thing hits another thing hits another thing and you just keep going and the problem is like, I get the, I get the fight through, right? Like get through, grind through, like get through it. Like I'm a grinder, right? So yeah. I, I don't knock the grind, right? Like, cause I am a grinder. So I get it. So I'm not going to knock it. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. The thing is, is one thing doesn't have to influence another. Yeah. Right. So it's always like, stop the domino. And do you, whatever you are right now, this state, is this the state you want to interact with the people you love the most with? Right. And if that answer is no, what is that state? What does that state look like? What does it feel like? Right? So all, now they're thinking of what it feels like. So your body starts feeling it because it doesn't know the difference between being in it and being thought of. Right? So it's, it's automatically, let's start getting into that. So like you said, reframe, but I, rather than saying, because when I say reframe, people are like, Oh, you fluff fluff. Right. I'm like, look at me. Do I look like a fluff fluff guy? Right. And uh, <laughs> I got like seven teeth left. Give me a break. <laughs> right. I might be only able to eat fluff, but I'm not a fluff fluff guy, but it's like, so it's like, what does that feel like? What does that look like? When you've been in that state, what has been the outcome, right? Because he, we all want that result. Yeah. So if that has been the outcome, that's what we have to be in to get it. So if you don't want to fight with your wife, don't come in looking for a fight. It's an easy way to get in one, right? Right? Like if you, if you want to have a, a, like a relaxing night with your family, come in like you're going to have a relaxing, come in with someone that wants to be around you. Yeah. Right. Cause if I come in slamming things on edge, my daughter's probably going to want to walk to her room. Like, okay. Right. It's uh, just like, oh, sometimes when I see my daughter, I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Right. Because uh, it's like, I know she's 17. Life is crazy for her. Right. Like that's in her mind. Like someone didn't do the right thing in English class. Life is over. And I just see her face. I'm like, rut row. Right. So, like, so I have to get at a higher level. Cause I'm like, I know she's coming in hot and I gotta, I gotta be able to handle it and bring up. Right. So it's, it's understanding what's the end result I want from this. Right. What do I have to do to be able to get there? So all too often we do the what's the end result. How can other people get us there? Yeah. But with, with our family, with the ones we love, with our relationships, with our friends, it's what's the end result we really want from that. How can I be the one to navigate us there? Yeah. I think it's right? very important. Taking that that. Ownership. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Taking ownership. I was about to say that. That's, that's awesome. When you said that there's a few things we talked about there and let's dive back into that. Um, Michael growing up, and I know this is a big part of your story, and I, you've probably told it a million times. So let's, let's, let's do a Cole's note of you growing up, and then I want to pick certain parts of it. Let's right. talk about your, and, and how you described, I mean, the other day to me, I still have it locked in my head. I got a visual of the uh, rusted pipes on your 
popped. Let's let's go through that. Let's. I, I had like that. I I, came, I went home that day and I told my wife that and I was laughing my head off. I go, how did you even describe that? Like, how were you thinking that? So let's talk about that <laughs> aspect of it and everything that happened as a child to make you who you are today. Right. They always say branding. Right. Branding is not your logo. Right. Like this is a brand identifier. Yeah, I think that's important to notice, right? So it's not your logo is not your brand, like your colors aren't your brand. Your brand is how people remember you. That's yeah. your brand, yeah. right? So it's it's funny that you said that because most people are like, "Oh, the rusty pipes guy," and seriously, like, yeah, okay, I'm it. like, "That's my brand," right? Like, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, so I'm the youngest of six, right? Yeah. My dad was like 43 years old, right? He lied to my mom and said he got his things done so he couldn't have any more kids. All right. And uh, he was making a jacuzzi room. They were going to have, he was going to put a jacuzzi next to their bathroom. He was actually building this thing that a little bigger than a closet. It might've been like a walk-in closet type thing. And he's like, we're going to make this a jacuzzi room. And he was building, he changed the studs. My dad was like this crazy weird engineer, right? Like uh, he built the studs out for the floor to be able to handle it, put the framework and everything. And my mom walked in and was like, Hey, remember when you got that surgery? You know, we couldn't have any more kids. He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm pregnant. And he's like, and she goes, you know what else? He goes, what? He goes, this is the nursery. And it went from the jacuzzi room to my room. <laughs> right? So uh, he hated me from the bat. He called me rat my like his entire existence because I ratted him out because I can't because I was because I was born. Right. But he was an old man when he had me. He was like 43 years old. He didn't think he could have me anymore. So everybody else in my family, like darker hair, darker skin, and me, white, really white, and and red hair because he had rusty pipes. <laughs> so that's how I came out. So let's fast forward. How was your relation with your dad? Uh it was it was it was it was it was what it was. It was how do you say it? Like me now I try to pay a lot of respect to my dad because I realized I was a lot of the problem. Uh, it was rocky. Um, there was, uh, especially later, right before he died, I got real lucky. Me and my dad didn't talk from like 16 to 18 for like a two year span. I yeah. moved out, went on my own. And um, he actually asked to meet me for lunch. And I was like, oh God, here we go. All right. And I was like, sure. We went to a place called Jim Dandy's. And uh, he was like, listen, my mom was like, had so many different health problems that we didn't know how long my mom was going to live. Right. Yeah. And so he's like, for your mom's peace, can we have a relationship for your mom's peace? You don't have to do anything. Like you, you don't have to, you like, don't move back in, nothing like that. But for your mom's peace, can we do this? And I was like, no, my mom's like an angel, right? Like literally is supporting me through everything. Like, yeah she shouldn't have right <laughs> she should have cut to, cut ropes with me a long time ago and ran right when i was younger and she didn't so i was like for mom i'll do anything so i was like yeah sure and i was so lucky that happened because like four months later he passed away and it was crazy my mom's still here <laughs> and she's like beat cancer multiple times like all kinds of crazy stuff like she's still here um but my my father who was like a mountain of a man super healthy military right like thought he would live forever in the middle of one night gone right and uh, i'm so thankful for that conversation and then the four months after that where we had a silver and the last thing i actually said to my dad ever was i love you and i think now i'm like because so many things he said to me that i thought he was wrong i found to be true like he was right so it's like i never got the opportunity two things it's like two things that i'll always be a piece of me is that i never got the opportunity to say he was right and i was wrong and own my shit with them, which uh, that's why one of the biggest things I talk about is ownership, own your things, right? Because sometimes it's too late to own it to the people you need to, right? And then um, the second thing is like, when he passed away, I was still in court. I was still a troublemaker. It, it was still, it looked really bad for my existence and he didn't get to see the turn to where, to where I wasn't that guy, that punk kid anymore, right? So it's like, he never got to see me become what all along he was trying to make me become was a, better, a, a man, right? So, so there's two things I'll always eat because it's like, damn, like, I, like, I, like me, I believe God. I, I hope he's looking down and just saying like, you did it, boy, like I'm proud of you, right? Because that'd be, that'd be a cool conversation. Um, so I like that. And, but that's also part of my decision-making every day. It's like, uh, there was a long time where I lived with the idea that I shouldn't be alive. I lost so many people 
that were close to me, so many people doing the exact same thing I did, right? That literally until like three years ago, I finally broke this, this thing that kept being my demise. It kept, I would get so high, crash, get so high, crash. And it's because why would I be able to live this did life? You ever, did you ever figure out what that was? Yeah, you, it you was. Pinpointed? Yeah. Yeah, it was my mindset was why do I get to have this life and they don't? It's almost like survivor's guilt. Yeah. So I shouldn't get that good a life because they don't get to. Right? And I, I know you know some of my story, like some of the people that passed away in my life, I have a lot of guilt over too because yeah. there was things I could have done differently that might have would have changed the situation. Right? And so there was a lot of guilt. So I had that guilt and that worth feeling and then dealing with the thing, the, the mindset of me from when birth that I wasn't smart enough I, that I wasn't good enough, that I, I didn't prove enough, right? Having all those in there with that and then all the hurt I held inside because I didn't know how to deal with that. So I portrayed anger, a second emotion, because that's how I thought you coped as men, right? So taking all that, that's what I just kept crashing. And finally someone reframed it and they said, man, you really lost a lot of people. Like, I'm not even going to lie. Like, like you have lost a lot of people in your life. That's, that's, that's tough being your age and going through that kind of loss. So I, all I ask is this, is that what kind of life would you want your people to live if they were here? And I, I said, that, I is, like, that is, so, that is so strong. Right. Powerful. So I'm like, yeah. So I was just like, so I'm not even thinking, right? Like I'm not even smart enough to figure out what they're doing. Right. So I'm like, Oh my God, let me tell you, right. Like, like they're on the mountaintop, like they're living the life of luxury. Like they don't have a problem. Right. And I like, I'm going on and on and on and on. Right. And they're like, man, a piece of you died when they died. And I was like, hell yeah. And they're like, but a piece of them lived because you live. I was like, of course. Yeah. I live for my people. I got them all tattooed on my back, right over a warrior's death mark. Right. And uh, they're like, right. So how about you live the life you want them to live because they're living in you. And it was just like, all right. Right. Like good play. You got me. Right. And, uh, and from that point on, it was... How, how old were you, Michael? Now? No, then. That uh, like 34, 33. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, and it was like, the light, like, it was bingo. You're right. I'm going to live the life that they all should have lived. So they get to experience it through me. And, and since then, uh, it's been rocket yeah. fire. Yeah. I love that. It's so powerful, right? It's just, and, and you had the opportunity to have somebody bring that to your light. And the scary part is a lot of people don't have that opportunity. And I think right. that's why I think it's important to have people like you and myself and others that are reaching out and trying to change the vision and the outcome of a lot of people just by allowing them to see the truth. Right. And I think that is so powerful because it's, you always had it in you. You just needed to get it pulled out of your ass, right? That's all it was. Right. That's all it I just, was. Right. I just needed to look in that area. And the thing I always say is like, listen, that came out at like a business retreat. Like that wasn't even something that it wasn't like I was with a, a mental health clinician, right? Like I wasn't with some therapist or doctor, right? It was, I was just around a bunch of people that want to move forward, want to go for a forward thinking, light vision, care about care about people. Right. And, and this person just took that time to say like, because we were talking about businesses that the fluctuation of your business and, yeah, and yeah. different strategies to kind of stop it. But we, everybody was talking the business strategy. But this guy pinpointed me in a heartbeat and he was like, it's not business with you. It's in you. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And go, go. go down, yeah. No, just, just went, just went down that road. So that's why I always talk about retreats and that's why we always try to have masterminds. Like, because I saw the power of that, of how it can change one's life. Just being in that room in that setting with those but Not people. even in a room in a setting. And we, we, you hear this over and over and over again, Michael, is surround yourself with people you want to be like, people mm -hmm. that are at a spot in their life that you want to achieve, or people that are on the same path as you. They don't have to be higher you. They could be below you, but they're on the same path as you. Mm -hmm. And life just instantly gets better if you're around you I, I remember my mom and you hear this all the time i remember my mom always says as a kid saying the same thing to me like tell, you always have a saying you, tell me your 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 five closest friends and i'll tell you who the hell you are <laughs> and it's just just the way it is people bring you down and mm -hmm. as humans we have to 
analyze and figure out who we are, who we want to be, and then surround ourselves around people just like that. And no, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to cut people out of your life. Somebody's mm-hmm. hard to cut people out of your life that have been there for so many years, but you have, it doesn't mean you have to cut them out. You got to put them aside. You can still be there for them and try to help them see your vision, but sometimes you just got to put them aside. And if they do not want to change, you got to cut them because all mm-hmm. they're doing is holding you back. And, and whether it's through retreat, through social media, whatever you find an outlet to surround yourself with mm-hmm. people, especially with social media, it's so easy to connect mm-hmm. nowadays, finding people that are, have commonalities, people that have the same rapport as you, building that up and just surround yourself around them. Life gets so much better, so right. much better, man. It's funny you say that because uh, a couple of years back, like two years ago, that was the year of my cut, right? Like where I had to stop. Because all too often we come from, it's, you didn't leave your people. Yeah. Right. You didn't leave your people back. You brought your people with, like, you, that's what you do. Like you, you're a sellout if you don't. Yeah. Right. It's uh, and, and as my mindset shifted around that a little bit to a degree, uh, I still get a little hard on some of those things, but it was, it was two conversations I had that really like blew my mind in this area. Because uh, I kept saying, like, the business was stopped. It wasn't falling back, but it was stopped. Like, yeah. this was as high as we were getting, right, around this mark. We weren't really beating it, no matter different strategies we tried. It was just this, we were hitting this. And, and someone said to me, they're like, you can't force people to go. Like, you're trying to force someone. All that does, it's the same thing as a relationship with my daughter. If you force them, it creates resentment. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you're creating resentment with your people. You, you can give them the option to come. You can't make them. And as long as you keep trying to drag them, you're not going. And I was like, I can't leave my people. Like, that's not what I do. Like, you don't understand. It's, it's not in my blood. It's not my DNA. Like I stay, I stay and fight with my people. And uh, like, I always say, I always didn't bring up uh, which funny a movie was just released about Fred Hampton. He did an amazing speech. It's not in the movie, but about how he made it to the mountaintop. Like this is, this is a story where I'm like, I resonate so much. I made it to the mountaintop. And I got all of a sudden like politicians were hanging out with me and people in prominent positions. They were calling my name and like cheers. And it was, it was crazy. Like people I never thought I would have an association with at all. Right. I was getting awards. Like I was someone cool. Right. And I, I looked down the mountain and I saw my people were in the valley. So I said, what am I, am I going to stay on this mountaintop living this lifestyle, right? The life of luxury, or am I going to go down and help my people? So I left the mountaintop and I went to the valley. I went to the valley because my people were in the valley and their problems were in the valley. So we we're going to fight the problems in the valley. And then we're going to climb the mountain together. And we're going to kick that fake king off the mountain because we're from the valley. Right. And I always resonated with that speech because I'm like, that is like, that's me. Like I'll always go fight for my people. Right. And he was like, great. Like, I love that. And your people will love that. Make sure they're your people though. Yeah. Because your people aren't going to hold you back. And the biggest thing is the people that you're meant to serve is further down the road that you're holding yourself back from going. So now they're waiting on you and they don't know they're waiting on you, but there's hold They're in a hold pattern because you won't go because you're here sticking with people that aren't even your people. You're being selfish for the people you're meant to serve and they're waiting for you to serve them. And it was like, Oh, sh-. yeah, I love that. And there's another way even to looking at it too, Michael is never fear getting ahead or never fear by you getting ahead that you're leaving your people behind mm-hmm. because you getting ahead is giving you opportunity to help them. Right. So I I just had a conversation with somebody the other day and they're like, how was your, we're having this deep conversation. They were like 2020, a lot of people suffered business wise. A lot of people lost their business, especially in my field, the gym business. I deal with mom, pop up martial arts gyms and in, in Ontario alone, we're from 48 of them closed their doors. And I see that. And, and they're like, you shouldn't be, bragging if you did well and i'm like i'm not bragging i'm telling people i had the best year of my life but that has allowed me now to coach get at a higher level 
that I'm going to help more people. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not turning around and, and regretting what I did. I'm proud of what I did. I'm going to tell the world what I did because now it's giving me the opportunity to be on top of the mountain and I could help so many more people climb that mountain because I got there and I know the route to get there. So it's, it's the same similar way where you get to the top. It's, it's never be scared to pull away from your friends. And as long as the ones that really want to be with you, they're going to follow your lead after. And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to break those branches and create a path for them. Right. So that yeah. having that mindset is just, is, 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 is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And what you did was you became the guide because you went there. Yeah. So now I can go back down. I can show you how to come up because I, I didn't. Right. And one of the things I always think about, this is an amazing speaker. And I always forget his name and it makes me mad every time with myself because I forget his name, but he has the most saves for the coast guard for uh, like, uh, accents at sea or ocean, right? In water. And he has the most saves. And they were like, they were doing this interview and they were really trying to boost him up. And he was like one of the most humble people talking. And they were like, no, you just have to be so good at this. Cause like how, and he was like, no, like really, it was just at our mindset and how we're trained and just, and just how we go about it. And they were like, all right, all right. You have the most saves. Like, how do you do it? Like, how do you pick who to save? You couldn't save everyone. He's like, well, that's a weird way of asking it. Right. But you're right. And he's like, but so when you jump into the water, there's a whole bunch of people in the water Yeah, and you look and you'll start seeing people. Some people are like trying to hang on to stuff. Some people are going the wrong way. Some people are trying to grab onto a buoy, grab on something on the boat. Right. And there's some people swimming towards you and you start by grabbing the one swimming towards you. I grab them. I put them on the rope. I swim a little further, grab the next, put them on the rope. And he said, the guy before him taught him save the one swimming towards you the closest first, because then you'll be able to save the most. If you go for the one farthest away, everyone drowns. Yeah. If you go for the one closest, keep the one swimming towards you, the ones coming towards you, you'll be able to help the most. And I started thinking that in life, as I'm going in my journey, there are going to be people that go to hang on other things, right? There are going to be people that are go towards other buoys. There's going to be people that do other things. And that's fine. That's life. Like we got to know that. But there's also going to be more people that swim towards you. So start, go, go towards the people that are swimming towards you. Because they're the people you're meant to serve, help, and connect with. All right. So it's just, I think about that every time I'm going, who's swimming towards me? And I, am I trying to, that's, am that's I trying so, to help someone so swim towards me or away? Yeah, that is so powerful. I love that. And I love how I like, I love what you said at the beginning of our conversation today is, is something that I think is precious and it's not a bad thing. It's actually a really good thing is simplifying things. I like things simplified because it makes the, the visual aspect of the VNA, like the visual aspect just makes life so much easier because you could teach it to so many more people and keeping it simple and keeping visual, you're making so many more people understand that. And you just, the visual and, and the simplicity of that is so powerful, right? So I love that aspect. Let's talk a little bit about, we, we haven't even talked about you as an entrepreneur at all yet. <laughs> Let's talk okay. about your business ventures, not even the coaching. Let's talk about your business ventures quickly, what you're doing, uh, how you got into them quickly. And then we're going to talk about your coaching, but let's talk about your business ventures. Like right. you have a whole bunch of um, crazy little businesses happening. <laughs> right now. So let's talk about that. All right. uh, first, I have a sign that says, it says kiss and everybody thinks it's the band, but really it's my method of keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It's like, so that's, uh, that's always my thing. So I love that you said that. And it's so true. Uh, I think most, uh, I'll, one random ass stat, most politicians speak at a sixth to third grade level. Why? The ones that win is because they make the message that more can understand. Um, for me to, for me to re relate to you, I have to understand you. Yeah. I if I can't understand you, I can't relate. So uh, me with businesses, bro, I love, like, I love business. I love impacting lives. And as I grew as a person before, when I was younger, like, I didn't have a great set of skills. Like, I wasn't like some like, you know, James Bond, MacGyver, or Dookie Hauser. Anybody that knows any of them. If not, I just showed my age. But uh, the, the idea was like, I wasn't. Age right there. All three I of them resonate. Yeah, right. I wasn't a prodigy, right? So when I first started, I was just like, yo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. First, I always had the hustler mindset, the mindset of like, we can make it. We don't need, we don't need that. We can do it ourselves if we want to. All right. So uh, first was a &M, Accessories and More. Where I was like the door-to-door -door salesman guy. All right. And it was miserable. Like that, like that was such tough skin building because people call you awful things when you're on their porch and they don't want you there. Yeah. Right. So, right. So it was, it was great though. It, it, I won. I learned rejection early and not stop because you have to bang on a hundred doors to make like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Right. So it was just like, I got to bang on doors. I don't care. 
right? So it, it, it taught that persistent, that grit, that, that thick skin you need to be able to make it. I think that's one of the qualities you need to be able to make it somewhere big is you need to have some thick skin. And uh, so, but my buddy could make uh, e-commerce sites in the nineties and those were huge back then because there wasn't that many, right? So I was just like, so he's smart, right? So I'm gonna hang around him because he's gonna, he's gonna get us somewhere. So that helped that business. I always say it was because of me, but really we only made anything because of him. <laughs> um, but after that, and after I decided I wanted to get out of Dodge because there was just crazy situations that happened, um, I, I opened a restaurant and bar. Why? Because I could pour drinks and I could flip burgers, right? Like that. It doesn't take any, uh, an extreme skill set to flip a burger or make a drink. Now, there's some people that have mastered that skill set, but to the basic necessity of that skill set, simple, right? So that was my, I could impact people. I could help people. I could, I, we could have a good time. We could build connection. We could build a relationship. Yeah, I could feed you so you're not hungry. I'd create a meal for you and your family or you and your friends to have that moment, right? There's so many bigger things than just, yeah, hey, yeah. here's a burger. So it was, and then it was landscaping. I could cut a lawn, right? Like I, right? I could plant a flower. Like I could do that, day, right? Like these work, right? Like I got it. Uh, and that was also part of my thing was a lot of my early years was hand skills, not, not mind skills, hand skills. Um, and I think part of that was program and also part of that was my skill set. I always thought that was part of, you know, I'm a man, I could do this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but then it was landscape. It was property management. All right. Well now that's different. That's a different price bracket. Yeah, totally. Right. Right. So now you're, you're, that's the real scaling. How do you take something that's the skill and make it this demand? How do you leverage the skill? Right. And so, it was the property management. Then we opened food trucks and catering companies, right? And we had a gift basket store. That was like probably the, one of the worst ideas I had. Um, <laughs> that was that was miserable. But it was then it was then as I as I grew, this grows, right? Like as this grows, this grows. Yeah. So then it was counseling, uh, a counseling agency, a suboxone clinic, right? Then it was my brother's nonprofit. I brought back, right? To and I brought it into Delaware. Right. And then it was unleash you now. Right. So it was like, and true good stables and a gala, right? Like there's so many different things as this grew, I saw what could grow. And, and then the price point per business also changed as this grew, it grew. Yeah. Right. So then I became just addicted to make this grow because then I started understanding true power. Now with your businesses, for example, which ones are you still physically running? Are you still running these all? Like the bar? Uh, on, or I'm not. No, no. Oh, the bar burnt down. That was one. Of, that's where I. Uh, that's where I almost gave up entrepreneurship. Um, I didn't. Of one, I learned a valuable lesson about having proper insurance. Yeah. Because uh, I didn't. Right. And then, uh, so I lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in it. And then also it was looking in the face of all the people that worked there, and letting them know that you know they no longer, uh, you know, have a spot. Yeah. That. Uh, and they didn't have, they didn't have, they didn't have a job and they had to go find a job. And I was just like, listen, I'll try to provide as long as we can until you find another thing that can provide. Yeah. Right. Um, that hurt because it was like, man, uh, when you let so many people down for so long, you fight like hell not to let it happen again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then when it does, you're just like, damn. All right. So literally it was four days after the fire. I was in the restaurant by myself. Everybody left. I was sitting there on one of the few chairs that didn't burn and I just started crying because it was just like, I didn't know, I didn't have like, what was the next move to help? All right. It was just like, shit. Um, and them and their families and their kids. And it was just like, you understand the ripple effect of what you're doing, the impact it can have positive and negative. Yeah. All right. So, so that's where I was just like, yo, I'm done with this. Like I'm never having someone's hands in life in my hands. All right. I'll go work. I'll get a paycheck. I don't care. All right. Um, but no, so the restaurant's not there. The businesses that are still here, we still have the food trucks, we still have the catering company, we still have the landscape, we still have the property management, we still have the counseling agency, it's a boxing clinic, True uh, Egala and True Get Stables, uh, the investment company we have, that was later on in life. Um, the nonprofit's still here and Unleash You Now, of course, is still here. So a lot of them are still here. A few gift baskets and restaurant or not. So as an entrepreneur, I mean... I'm, I'm, I'm similar to you. I got a lot of different ventures because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, you a, inspire me. I'm a, yeah, right. <laughs> Let's get the other way around. <laughs> but there's a lot of, when you, when you're so spread thin, time management, the right people around you is very important. How do you, 
and I think this is, could be a great lesson for entrepreneurs that are looking at different ways of bringing income. Because 2020, if anything, it made a lot of entrepreneurs realize having one income that could be altered by something in life is a shit way to live. Yes. And, and, and being able to, one, re shift your business or reallocate your business or revoke your business in the right direction is going to make a huge difference. But second, having different forms of income to sustain you through times like that is so important. Going through as an owner of so many different businesses, what advice would you give entrepreneurs that are looking at starting their second or the third business when they haven't sometimes mastered their first yet? So it's interesting as, as I grew, my mindset in this kind of changed, right? And one, I would start by starting a business for a business sake is a horrible idea. Love that. Right. Because businesses fail often, right? Businesses fail often. There's a reason why like 4% make it 10 years. Yeah. Right now, if you're uh, Cole Hatter from Thrive, I finally thought of someone's name, uh, says uh, business for purpose. I love that. I say uh, business for mission. My business is on a mission, yeah. right? And I, I love creating movements, right? So I'm a nerd and I studied the, the, the companies and businesses that made it long, right? They beat the odds because yeah. I want to study anyone that beat the odds because I want to know how you did it, yeah. right? Like you said, they're a guide up the mountain, right? So they didn't create just a product. Most of them don't even have the same product that started their company. What they did was they started a movement, right? They started something bigger than itself, right? Think about Apple, right? Like Apple wasn't the phone company, yeah. right? Like they didn't make phones, they made computers. Then they made uh, a music player, right? Like then turned into the best smartphone, didn't even start the first smartphone, just the, the, the one, the most used one, I don't necessarily, best yeah. judgment, the most used. Right. What they did was they were for the misfit. They were for the one that didn't want to be in the cubicle anymore. They were the one that wanted the color outside the lines. Right. They didn't, they didn't like, I, I always say they, they were outside the box for us. We know there's no box. There's no yeah. box. Like yeah. if yeah. you're inside the box, that means that they're, you're thinking the way they want them to. If you're outside the box, you're thinking the way they don't want you to. Yeah. Right. So there's no freaking box. Kick the box out. There's no box. Just be you. Right. Yeah. Just think your way. And so it was like, they created this thing that was bigger than a product. They created people that will follow them, whatever they do. Listen, I'm, I'm one of the clowns. I have the iPhone. I have the iMac, right? Like I have the iPad, I have the, I, the MacBook Pros, I have the desktop, like, and they're all linked together. It's fantastic, right? But it's like, it's, it makes it where I could do work anywhere I'm at. It's great, right? But it's like, because I was that misfit, right? I resonated with their mission, their, their, their marketing, their branding, I right? love you said that. Let's, let's talk about that quickly. That's their branding, brand identity, and their mission. You said that. Their right. mission statement was very clear from day one. And everybody yeah. in that company understood it, believed right. in it. And if they didn't, they're out of the company. Right. The culture, what it stood for, what it meant, their pillars that they built their company on, yeah. they make sure everyone in the company has that. Yeah. You can't, you can be a great person and not fit my company. There's amazing people that have come and said, Mike, you want to team up? And I say, just, we just, we don't our thing and your thing, we don't fit on top of each other. The foundations aren't the same. Yeah. So we can't put the buildings on top of each other. You're awesome. I dig what you do. We just do it for different reasons. All right. And that's cool. Do your thing. I'm a huge fan. We just can't combine because the, it won't fit the foundation. All right. So, and then the other part, so that's, that's what you have. That's what you build, right? You build a foundation, you build the pillars, you build a culture. The other thing you have is vision. Where are you going? What are we, where are we going to? And if we don't align in that vision where we're seeing, that's going to be a hard fit too, because then we're going to, all right. And two visions equals division. Yeah. Right. And I heard that line once and I was just like, that was brilliant. Like whatever I was listening to, I was like, I didn't think anything else was good, but that line was amazing. Right. So it made the whole thing good. I'm like, you're one of the smartest people ever existed. They're like, you love my presentation. No, I like that one line you said, right? And it's like, I'm like, now I'm the dickhead. I really didn't mean it like that. But that one line you said just hit me, right? And it was with two visions, all you have is the vision. And it's like, you got to have one vision yeah. and everybody see it. So whoever's vision that is, you got to paint it in such a way that everybody can see it, yeah. right? And, and I think if you can establish the culture, the foundation in which it's on, 
and the vision and where it's going and everybody that comes in falls with that, you, anything's possible. You got it. I love that. I love it. Cause you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. Like everything you're saying is, is my mindset, right? That's exactly how I, how I, and that was a lot in there. And there's a lot, it's a great lesson for entrepreneurs, but I mean, my thing is branding, right? And, and building a brand identity, building a passion, building something you're passionate about, building around it, finding something that's in need, find a need. If you have a passion for it, you have a vision, follow the vision. And I do, I, I, I love that line because a lot of times the two visions happen when you don't have, if you do bring in a partner, they don't have the same vision as you. Mm-hmm. And that's why I've, I've got, I've had a f- quite a few companies and only two of them I've actually brought in partners. And those two times, great guys till this day, I'm still friends with all of them. We just, we just didn't have the same vision. And right. the businesses didn't work because we didn't have the same vision. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I love that part of it. We've been talking for an hour now and this has been a great conversation. You never know when you're going to a podcast, how it's going to go. Cause sometimes we talk a lot about life. Sometimes we talk a lot about business. Sometimes we get a little, get a lot of gold nuggets out of it when it comes to Ashley lessons. And this conversation is actually dive in a little of everything. We got to know you a little, not as much as I wanted to dive into. <laughs> we got to know a little bit about you, but we got a lot of lessons. We talked about a family. We talked about business. We talked about branding. So it's been, uh, I, I love it, man. What a great conversation. I always ended off by asking one question and through our whole podcast, I never ever have a set set of questions. I never know who the people are. I try not to learn. I try to know as little as I can about you to learn as much as I can about you on the podcast, keep it as real open conversation as possible. And one set question I always ask all all our guests at the end, if you were to pass today in a few words, how would you want to be described or remembered by your loved ones? Hmm. This is where you're supposed to say great question again. Great question, right? Dude, I will say this. Your, your, uh, your show definitely surprised me. Seriously? I, we, oh, yeah. We, we went in so many different areas. I was not expecting. So uh, I, I'm impressed. Uh, the, the way you do it, it, very, it flows and it did hit a lot of different areas. Yeah. Um, man, that's so hard. Um, Think I right care. What, what are you trying to impact? How do, how do you right. want to impact and leave? My thing is I want them to know that I was a man that cared. Yeah. Right? Like I was a man that cared. I cared deeply about my people, about the people I serve, about the people I love. Right? I cared deeply. Like it's what makes me go, why I'm in grind mode all the time. And people like, dude, you're going to burn out, blah, 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 blah. Right? And was like, you don't understand. Like I will not burn out. I freaking love this. Like, this is my everything. Yeah. It's because I want to find ways to help. I want to find ways that we can, we can get better, that we can grow. Yeah. I went back to the valley, yeah. right, to go to all of us to walk up that mountain, kick that fake king off the top of the mountain and say, we're from the valley and we're here. It's like, I want us all to live that life we know we can live because it's possible for all of us. And I care so deeply about it that it, there's no such thing as burnout for me. I'll go. I'll go until the good Lord takes me home I love or I go to Valhalla, whatever first. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I mean, it's, it, 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 you're, it, once again, you're preaching to the choir. Cause I, I, I look at my wife sometimes and she's like, how are you still going? How do you, do you know, this is honest truth since March 18th, 2020. I mean, I block my family time. Family is everything to me, but I have not had a day off work since March 18th. I've worked yes, every single day since March 18th last year. And, Are you going for a year? And it, it, I mean, I, it, you don't even put a time on it. You just keep going. You just <laughs> doing, you do what you have to do as an entrepreneur. And you when, when opportunity is flowing and things are happening, you have to ride the wave. You cannot oh, drop it because it's just, it's such a, it, you know, when you're in the zone as an entrepreneur, you know, you figure it out, you know, when you're in the zone and when you're in the zone and everything is just flowing and everything's coming together, you just ride the wave, man, ride the wave right. and continue to network and build, build your own. I always say, I, I, I use everything as an analogy of a sports team. You're building your own sports team around you. You're building your, your all-star team and bringing people like you in my life, bringing people, you're just building this all-star team around you that you're all going to impact each other. And I look uh-huh. at you and I, it's like, I want you to be on top of that, that mountain. And I want to be on the top of the other mountain and say, Hey, what's up? Throw a paper, 
paper, paper airplanes to each other and wave at each other because there's enough, there's enough mountain in this world for everybody. Oh, dang right. There's enough room on the mountain for everybody. And you just have to ride the wave and just, and, 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 and when things are high, just keep going, man, because there are going to be dark times ahead. Everybody goes through dark times, whether it's personally, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is, is when you are in your high time, you got to ride it. And for the last, God, 11 months, I've been on this high ride. And I'm loving it and I'm enjoying it. I'm loving networking people. I'm loving, like, I, as of March, I didn't have a podcast. I wasn't certified as a coach. I didn't, I was, I was running all these great businesses, but I, I, I was coaching people for free, but I never was getting paid. I didn't have a platform. I didn't have a book. In a matter of 10 months, I took pen to paper. I got certified. I wrote a book, started the podcast, started coaching, build a platform on top of everything I was all doing. And, and if you do it properly, it just starts flowing. It starts. I released my book on Monday. Michael, if you saw my post, I'm going to do another post recently today. I released my book on Monday without telling nobody because I didn't want my mom, nobody else to go shopping and buying a ton of the books before they went things just to see what would happen. And we released it on Amazon, released on a couple sites, but on Amazon, I got to number one in eight categories organically, just with the, just with the marketing, we, we have a marketing team, but without nobody helping or nobody knowing eight categories, number one in 48 hours. And no it's doubt. just, it's everything happens. We sold 504 copies in 48 hours. And it's just, and it's, it is just without even telling a soul. And it's just because all the hard work I knew it was going to happen. I didn't think it was gonna happen that quick, but it's just putting all the hard work in and it all comes together. Right. So I appreciate you're, you're definitely a hard work. You're definitely a hustle. Hustlers is, is, is that should be, do you have that tattoo on yourself? No, okay. I thought about it, but no. Um, the one thing you said earlier too, I'm sorry for. Yeah. yeah 100%. You said something earlier that I think it's a great way for people that are jumping in or trying to do something new or pivot or whatever. It's, the two, you have to answer these two questions in one or two order, either first or second, but these two questions. Who do you want to serve? What problem do they have, right? How do you solve it? So it's, it's either what can you do to solve the problem, then who has that problem? Yeah. Or who do you want to serve? What problem do they have and how can you serve it? Yeah. All right. And if you walk through those steps, those, those easy questions, simple, I won't say easy, those simple questions then you have something that could be of use to people that you care about, or you have something you care about that people can use. Yeah. And then you don't just have a product or a business because you have that care factor. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. On our show notes, I'm going to put all the information on how to get a hold of Michael. Um, he, you actually have a mastermind in a, a hotspot coming up. Where, where is it and when? Mexico. And when is April it? April 22nd to April 25th. So this podcast will be released. Um, I'll try to get Spot this out before it. then. And I'll put some notes on it and I'll share that with our audience as well. Awesome. I'm going to put on all our show notes how to get a hold of Michael. Um, so many services, so much opportunity to grow and learn from Michael. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time and doing this for me. It was a great conversation. And and I, I, I love to see uh, where our future together holds because there's so many things I think we're going to do together. So I appreciate you, Thank brother. You. We know this isn't the end, and I'm honored and humbled that you had me here. Thank you. Thank you, brother.